Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Carey. I'm Vice President of Marketing here at Unbound Medicine. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Lunch with Liz. Um, we, today, we will be talking about medication error criminalization. Uh, nurse educators discuss patient safety, targeting medication administration and just culture. Uh, and this is presented by Unbound Medicine. First, I'd like to just thank you all for taking time out of your busy day today to, um, to join us for this very important topic. Um, and before I turn it over to our moderator, Liz Robison, um, just a couple of items, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, um, at the conclusion of the discussion, there will be a live Q&A. So if you do have questions, please put it into the question and answer box. Um, we're going to reserve the chat box for perhaps any technical issues you may you may be having. Um, and, and at the conclusion of today's webinar, there will be a survey. Um, and those surveys, we really appreciate your feedback. And those surveys help deliver future webinars. Um, so tell us the topics that you need and, and any feedback that we have to help incorporate and make these the best um, possible for you. So. That's everything I have at this time. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Liz, uh, and I'll see everyone at the end of the at the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> I also like to extend my thanks to all who have joined this live webinar uh, and taken time to watch this webinar in the future, uh, as it is a very important topic. That topic of communication, uh, criminalization of medication errors that has resulted in many other webinars uh, that I have attended over the last few weeks. And I think I even have one scheduled for tomorrow, but most of those have focused on the healthcare system uh, and what we can learn from the uh, tragic outcome that resulted in the loss of life and impacted only one family, but it also uh, in impacted the nurse that was involved with the error. Uh, when tragedy does happen, it does have a global effect. And so the essence behind this webinar is how can we respond Bond as nurse educators, uh, how do we have an opportunity to look at lessons learned from a nursing education perspective? How does that influence us as nurse educators? So I have on my panel today two very seasoned nurse educators um, who uh, uh, one was is represented at a university level, Dr. Danielle Walker, and the other one uh, is representing at a state community college level, Mrs. Maria Sumrall. And I wanted to get, give that perspective of two different uh, types of paths for education in the discussion today. Uh, uh, Dr. Walker comes from Texas Christian University and has published related to adapting a just culture assessment tool that was developed in the practice setting and applying it to nurse education. And as uh, you probably saw in the uh, brief of the screen, there'll be a reference list and you can uh, see the work that Dr. Walker has uh, published in that reference list. Uh, additionally, she also has worked with CUSIN as part of a task force and those that are in education should be very familiar with CUSIN's work. It's so important for us in terms of patient safety in education. Uh, Mrs. Summerall has focused on patient safety efforts with her her first year pre-licensure uh, nursing students and is passionate about bringing their experience in the practice setting to the educational environment. She does continue to practice in the practice setting. So uh, reason really why I wanted to tap into her expertise in that setting as well. And I wanna thank you both for taking time to participate uh, in this discussion about medication errors and just culture. To kind of set the tone, I, I wanted to show a quick clip uh, before we get started. And let me see if I can uh, get that going here. And it doesn't really have any sound, I realized, on my end of it. For some reason, the sound didn't project very well. But the, the essence behind the, the last little piece of that clip was 
uh, and both of these are referenced in your reference if you want to watch a little bit more information, but it really just scrolled across the, uh, the screen here, it has to do with um, a uh, clinical nurse specialist, uh, Mrs. Kelly Reap, who uh, is a clinical nurse specialist in critical care. And what she said in that particular discussion uh, webinar was the fact that the expert that was used in the case, uh, the criminal um, case, was not familiar at all with the term just culture. And so I felt like that was important. When I heard that, it really, it really resonated with me in terms of that term just culture. Um, so uh, I'd like to start the conversation really with that concept of uh, what kind of stimulated this case. What is a medica medication error and how in nursing education can we enable our graduates to recognize the importance of just culture as they enter the work, uh, workforce? So that's a very large theme that I'm uh, pulling from, but I'd like to uh, start with Dr. We uh, Walker in terms of, is it okay, Dr. Walker, if I call you Danielle? Of course. <laughs> so I like to start with uh, uh, Danielle and uh, her uh, research and efforts in the concept of just culture uh, uh, specifically. Thank you, Danielle. Of course. Well, um, my work has really centered around the idea of bringing just culture into the nursing education sets, um, setting because we educate these nursing students and then we send them out into the world and we want them to value this, but they're not necessarily experiencing it in their educational experience. And so that's really been um, the work that I've been doing. And it's been interesting. There has been a lot of research published about how different schools of nursing approach it. What we've done and what we're trying to do through CUSIN is getting everybody to start air reporting and good catch reporting within the nursing education programs, within simulation, within clinical, and within labs, so that their students are practicing this idea and that we're making students value and understand the concepts before we send them out into the real world where we want them to do this all the time. And it's really, we want nurses and nursing students to understand it's their responsibility to report these things. And it's normal and it's okay. Um, there should be good catches, right? We should all be having near misses. That shows flaws in our system. Absolutely. And just that uh, concept you really bring out in terms of uh, that human uh, fa fallibility that occurs as part of healthcare professionals, we see that um, uh, we, there are, there potentially may be opportunities for us to prove things, but if we don't uh, shed the light on those opportunities through reporting, then what have we done to improve patient safety? Uh, Maria, in terms of uh, your work as a nurse educator, what are some of the things that have come out in terms of your uh, role as a nurse educator in terms of uh, that culture of patient safety or even that just culture culture? So I have two situations. One with a student where we really we recognized the mistake that the student didn't want to open, acknowledge that the mistake was made. And this was um, several years ago before we decided to take a look at everything. So critical events, and you know, Danielle has been speaking about good catches. So there's a, a terminology phrase, a terminology change that we need to start looking at instead of saying critical event, that sounds like something's really, really bad, but let's, let's take a look at this and change that terminology so that it becomes a positive and you're not afraid to open up your mouth and say, a mistake occurred, it didn't go to the patient, but we need to recognize that sometimes it does matter about the words, how we're, how we're phrasing things. So um, that particular student, that was more than 10 years ago, um, but one, one thing that happened with me personally, and I went to go pull a Zosin, and most of you who work in the field know that Zosin takes a long time to go into solution unless you beat that bottle, so it's very, very fine powder. Um, and I grabbed what I thought out of the Pixis because we opened up a drawer and you've got 12 cubbies to pull out and I mixed it and it went to solution very, very quickly. Oh, wow, this is great. But the color was different. And I realized that I pulled, I did not pull Piperacil and Tazo, I pulled Cephapine. I was like, okay, I immediately called the pharmacy, told them what I did and I wrote an occurrence report. 
And I tell my students, don't be afraid to write yourself up as far as you know, the occurrence reports. It is better to let somebody know that a mistake was made before going to the patient than mixing it and going to the patient and then scanning the medication and going, I have the wrong medication. So being open and being willing to acknowledge your mistakes and owning it is what's very, very important. And we need to let them know that it's okay to make mistakes. We're not perfect, but you have to be vigilant and recognize there's multiple steps that go in the process before it finally goes to the patient. Yeah, and in our planning session, Danielle, you mentioned something about that too, in terms of some of the work that you have done uh, with that modeling piece. Yes, you know, so one of the things as I was listening to Maria just now that I was thinking was how much of a culture shift and an attitude change would it be if when that happens, nurses didn't think about it as writing themselves up or as just reporting something, but thought about it as protecting other nurses from something happening? Because if that had happened, maybe with the case that we're discussing, I bet you other nurses had done the exact same thing, right? And so, but they caught it before it got to the patient, just like you did. And like, we hope that we all do. But if four or five or six nurses had written up exactly the same way that you had, that system would have been changed, right? And yeah. it's just modeling that idea that it's not scary or something bad and having our students do it, you know, um, in the study that we did with over a thousand nursing students and 15 schools, 78% of the students reported that they had an air reporting system within their school. 12% had used it. That's it. And that is just shocking, right? So we've done the good work of getting it there, but now we've got to do the work of getting our students to actually use it and see it as something that it's their responsibility for. Exactly. exactly. And I and again, it's the terminology change. Is it called, you know, an occurrence report or is it going to be a good catch? Or this was a near miss because it never left the med room. But how, you know, can we change the word so it doesn't have such a negative connotation? Because a lot of what happens when you think of yourself writing yourself up, is this going to go on my record? Is this going to, how is this going to affect me? And yesterday I was speaking with our uh, chief medical officer about these occurrence reports. And he said it does not go against the nurses because they look at, is there a process here? And I, again, I spoke with the risk management. And as I said, I would like to know when I do, okay, we're going to call it what we call it right now in the current report. I would like to have the loop closed. What was done about that? Because if you don't have, you know, you're filling out these incidences, what's happening? I'd like to know, because you know, with their students, we give them, even in simulation, you have your pre-briefing, you have your scenario, and then you do your debriefing. Let's talk about what went well, what didn't go well, and what can be done to improve, to, to, to improve the situation. So I think closing the loop is so important, regardless of whether you're a student or a, a, a staff member on the floor, you need to know that when you're taking that time to, re to report a, a good catch, because that's what this was, it never left the med room, what was done about that? What can be done to improve? And as a culture, oh, oh sorry, no, I'm, sorry. Thinking, I'm probably inter you're probably going to say the same thing uh, as as that aspect of in nursing education, Danielle. You mentioned some of the things that TCU is doing to close that loop. We are. So, you know, one of the things that um, is really interesting, we actually reward our students for good catches and near misses. So they actually receive a badge that they can wear on their, um, like a, it's like a pin that they can wear on their badge that tells everybody that they, they caught a safety issue and that they reported it. And so it's become quite the thing because every year they change. And so the students really like to have them, but because, you know, it's a, it's a culture, right? We say just culture. It's not just, you know, an event reporting system, it's a culture. And if you don't close that feedback loop, people don't think that you value what they're reporting to them. And so at TCU, we use a newsletter um, and we send out a QSIN safety newsletter. We try to do it twice a semester. And you know, like everything, it's always difficult, but that sends out how many error reports have been made, how many good catches. We send out information, for example, if all of a sudden we're, we're seeing this type of air coming up or good catch, what we've been doing, how we reported that back. 
to the hospital. And then we often do a student's um, write-up or vignette talking about what they did and how that impacted them. A lot of times you see um, attributes like the two challenge rule or some of those safety yeah. things that we really teach our students coming out from their good catch report. And so we highlight those things. We include pictures of our students and we make sure that every student knows that when you submit a report, something is happening with it. Um, Nina Barkel at Oakland Community College actually taught me about the safety newsletter and really spearheaded it. They go a step even further beyond and they do one a month and they have a theme every month and highlight that theme. That's great. It is. It, it's building that culture. Uh, it really is. Um, it, it. It's not. As I listen to a webinar, uh, um, David Marks, who has a website that says the Just Culture Company, he really emphasizes it's not one and done. When you're building that culture, it's it's got to be embedded. So as nurse educators, really embedding that culture within our policies and procedures. So how have you saw in terms of that process, uh, Maria, in terms of things that may be uh, kind of counter to just culture and policies and procedures that we have in nursing education? Well, as far as counter to that, um, I know we used to have the knee jerk, you know, off with your head type situation if you, and I'm gonna go back to the situation that I had several years ago, um, the hospital, when you would pull up insulin, it had a hundred units. And if you didn't pay attention to what the sliding scale was, the student still not understanding how to read Meditech would draw up a hundred units and get ready to administer a hundred units. Well, that's what the that's what the EMR says instead of taking the time to look at what the sliding scale was. So this particular student did um, end up because this was before we made some changes. She um, did have to she chose to uh, withdraw from the program because it was a, a critical incident and had the other nurse not stopped her she would have given 100 units insulin for a blood sugar of 152. so that term critical incident uh and i just kind of reflect on that danielle what kind of language could we look at changing because that term critical incident seems so punitive it does, doesn't it? And so, you know, you could just change it simply to an incident, right? Um, we use the term safety report because that's all encompassing because it, implement, it impacts safety and safety is not negative or positive, right? It just is a thing. So trying to create that neutral language is really important with our students. And, you know, I mean, in that case, like it's not this idea of just culture. Some people think, well, oh, that's not, that's not right because there has to be something done for that student. And you're right. You know, we still do re-educate and do work with that student. It's not like it just gets thrown under the, the rug and we don't talk about it um, and we go on, but it's that shared accountability. I have a role in it. The student has a role in it. The systems have a role in it. And we're all, we're going to look at every part of what caused that issue to, fit, to happen. And you kind of bring up uh, 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 one of the questions uh, in terms of my background over the last um, several years, and I started really uh, dedicated full time as a nurse educator in 2017, is really in the simulation uh, world where there is that concept of a psychological safety in yeah. doing simulations in terms of the debriefing component and what we're doing in simulation. But many times when we are doing simulation, we see situations where we have opportunities to improve that. So in keeping in check with 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 a aspect of are you seeing common threads within a particular level regarding safety issues that are being found in simulation how do you uh, follow up with your faculty in terms of reporting those consistent themes in terms of behavior to provide that closed loop so to speak on areas that may need to be focused on are we looked at in terms of the curriculum the other aspect I know at one semester we tried to um, actually go through the process of completing a medication error report that was used by a local hospital if an error occurred, but uh, that process kind of uh, didn't didn't work in simulation. But what I found is many times the errors that occur in simulation regarding medications are not caught by the students; they're caught by the facilitators. Mm -hmm. And how do we bring into the discussion and debriefing about that uh, 
patient safety issue that occurred in simulation when the, the team that was involved in simulation didn't even recognize it. So I know you're not involved in a simulation, Danielle, but Maria, you have done some simulation. I and have. Speak from your perspective of just culture. So when um, we had several medication errors, they, um, they forgot to scan the armband. They forgot to scan the medication. And sometimes they forgot to scan the correct dose of the medication or they gave too much. You know, we don't have a fancy um, medic EMAR. We have a, a very generic EMAR. But that's something that we discussed because I would print out the MAR and uh, bring the empty packages of medications and the pill cups because, of course, the mannequins really can't swallow the pills. And I said, let's discuss the medications. What do you notice here compared to what was ordered and what was given? And all of a sudden, they start talking about it because the, um, the observers would comment, yeah, we saw that you, you forgot to scan the armband. You forgot to verify the patient's name and date of birth before you did this. You didn't do the five basic rights. And it was just really interesting having the, 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 the observers and the team working together. All of a sudden, you're right, we forgot to do this. But this was a safe environment for them to be able to, just, to discuss their, these mistakes. And so that when I had them on the floor, because I had, um, you know, had them sometimes I do simulation, sometimes I'd be on the floor. We would talk about those mistakes. I said, even though we don't talk about simulation, don't forget those five rights. And so that I could, you know, speak, you know, sometimes I could just give little uh, keywords to them and just reminders, oh yeah, you're right, I need to pay attention to this. And so that's, that's something that I have mentioned and just the light bulbs that go on, recognizing the importance of making sure you have the right patient and the right medication, and the right dose, mm -hmm. and the right time, and the right route. And, and I'd like uh, to encourage yeah, you to, yeah. Go, yeah, to go one it. step farther, yeah. right? Like, you know, don't just have the conversation, have them submit the report, make that the culture, right? Because it's scary to think of submitting a report, but if they do it in that safe space where they know it's okay, and no one's upset, and they know what happens with it, it's no longer scary. So maybe when they're on their own, they'll go ahead and do it. I feel like we do such a great job of talking about it, but we don't create that next step of submitting the reports. And maybe that's why our nurses in practice aren't doing it in the same way. And one of the things that I know we talked about before, Danielle, was the fact that um, in the practice setting, when you're uh, with nursing students in the clinical site and they see um, opportunities, good catches, how does that uh, flow back to the practice side on where you're doing your clinicals? We submit a report um, to every clinical site every semester about the good catches that are happening. Um, most of the time, they're pretty, you know, innocu innocuous. But when we do our good catch report, they do our students. It's anonymous if they want it to be, or they can put their name. But they do write what unit they are on, what hospital, and what floor. So that if all of a sudden one semester we see a bunch of falls happening on, you know, the fifth floor, we can report that back. And we're monitoring these every month. So if we see something really important, we'll report back much quicker than we need to. Um, but otherwise, we do that semesterly report because they're a part of our shared accountability model with that just culture as well. And they need to be informed about it as well. Yeah. Great approach. Uh, I know most schools have some sort of advisory council, a uh, great opportunity to maybe feed back some of those opportunities in a very positive uh, uh, form. Uh, so again, that brings that, that closed loop uh, component back to uh, the practice side as well. I, th I found it interesting when I was looking at information from our accreditation bodies regarding the concept of just culture, that when we look at um, the different accreditation bodies uh, for nursing ed education, and there's three right now, CCNE, ACEN, and NLN, CNEA are the three. And I know for the associate and the LPN level schools, there is primarily ASIN and the NLN uh, accreditation body. Uh, so uh, with uh, undergraduate baccalaureate hire is CCNE. And I found that really it was only within the CCNE essential uh, implementation uh, toolkit in domain five that there was discussion of JULS culture. So, uh, the, you know, I know accreditation bodies are always improving and I believe ACEN is actually going to change uh, update theirs in 2023, but thoughts on how accreditation plays into the process 
of uh, nurse education in terms of patient safety and just culture. Well, I'm glad it's in there so explicitly, finally. Um, and for us, they're competencies, right? So for AACN, that means that now we'll have to demonstrate that our students value safety reporting and that they can see their role in preventing errors. Um, and so I'm excited that they're there. I think they definitely drive nursing education at that basic level. Um, sometimes we think we're doing something, but we don't necessarily stress about it too much because we don't have to prove it. And so now we're gonna have to prove it. So I like that, I'm excited. And we'll see what changes happen because of it. Yeah, I think it's so important that we uh, recognize uh, opportunities that we can improve as overall in nursing education as well. So, uh, you know, there's some questions and answers that have come through uh, the portal that I've been looking at. Uh, in terms of some thoughts about, you know, I think the biggest concern when I was seeing a variety of different webinars regarding uh, this particular uh, case here, and, uh, and I do want to point out the fact that uh, a patient's life was lost, Charlene Murphy's life was lost as a result of this error, and as nurses, we're, we're so empathetic when, uh, with anything in terms of healthcare when it, it, it impacts uh, a person's life and it but it does provide us an opportunity I think we have as nurses we always uh, we always share with our students the importance of reflection when you have this kind of error that then has moved to, to criminaliz criminalization regarding a particular nurse as a result of this error many people view this as a individual being held accountable and not a system and and I, I, would, uh, I would share with the attendees that if you're interested in this within the reference are some webinars that go over more of a systems approach and how systems can change uh, as a re result of making opportunities safer for our uh, healthcare team as overall, but overall improving patient safety. I think that we just don't have enough time today to go over the breadth of all the system things that could possibly improve as a result of this. And we feel for uh, Redonda Vaughn uh, as she will, uh, uh, I believe at the end of this week, she will actually have um, the results of what the judge will um, uh, uh, note in terms of her sentencing, in terms of what she will get as a result of the charges against her. So we feel as well for a colleague that uh, is a nurse that has, uh, you know, when you listen to a lot of the things that are going out in terms of discussion, she was a nurse that was highly respected in, in Vanderbilt. Uh, she, was a, she was a very popular person that um, um, individuals wanted them her to be a preceptor. So she was well respected. And so we can understand in terms of nursing what this particular case can uh, do in terms of influencing other nurses. But I think, you know, with this discussion here, what is our role in terms of is nursing education? So some thoughts uh, with about this case and how this has influenced you as a nurse educator, Danielle, as well as Maria. I think it really puts the emphasis on the good catches and the near misses and our responsibility to report those. Um, it's not just about if the error actually happens, it's about improving the system for everyone. And it really makes you think about our role as keepers of safety, of protectors of safety. And it's not just for the individual patient that I have, but it's for the whole group. And that's really changed my perspective in that. Absolutely. Maria. Yeah, I like that, that idea too, you know, you have to be open and discuss this and, you know, and not be afraid to point out when a mistake is made, you know, because as you said, we are the patient, we are the keepers of patient safety. And that's something that we truly need to reinforce with the students is that the ultimate goal is patient safety. And what are, what are we or you or me going to do about maintaining patient safety? And that means, you know, I tell my students, let's look in the record. Are there any discrepancies that you see? Because that's one of our, our reflection questions. Have you found a discrepancy between the, in, within the medical record? And let's discuss this. And one student actually found that the patient was supposed to have been on medications. The doctor said he was, but it was never ordered. So that student actually brought it to the primary nurse 
I said, hey, let's get this taken care of. After coming to me, he said, let's go take care of this. I'm going to let you do the talking. So I was there to support that student and gave, gave the student 100% of my, my, my support and let's get this, get this done. And he was on cloud nine. And this is what happened because we did this and it just helped. It improved the camaraderie and the rapport with the patient saying he recognized that somebody was actually listening to what his concerns were. And when a patient feels that they're being listened to, they're more willing to step up and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I need. And when students see that, they're more willing to say, hey, I know I can make a difference and I can maintain my patient safety. And I know, uh, Danielle, you mentioned it with your work on CUSIN, uh, something that resume, re resonated with me in our prior discussions is the KSAs. That's right. Is, is that we can uh, teach knowledge. That's right. We can go over skills. But how do we influence attitude? That's right. And attitude is such a big part of culture, right? How do we make students value it? How do we make students think it's important? I guarantee you Maria's student now values and has an attitude towards safety, right? After that experience. Yes. And I love that's why I love that Cusin language, because it's not just about what they know and what they can do. It's about how they feel about it and what they value. Because we do and we act upon what we think is important. And safety has to be what's important. Yeah, absolutely. And in my world of simulation, I go back to the fact that that's really why we do simulation and we do it in an environment that you can't obviously cause patient harm. Um, for the most part, we, you know, you're even when you're using uh, live actors in terms of standardized patients, the thought is it is that environment that it's okay to make mistakes. Uh, but it's, uh, it's that opportunity to discuss it. So it kind of ingrains into that uh, attitude that how can, how is it okay to discuss something uh, in terms of process improvement? I know one of the things that I started in simulation because of our small program was having half the group observe uh, through a live stream and uh, while the others were uh, doing the simulation. And initially I just, it was more of a convenience. I, you know, I need to do something. I didn't want to have a large group in the simulation, but I saw the growth of the students from the first uh, simulation to the last simulation on their comfort level and being able to comment to their peers on opportunities for improvement very uncomfortable initially because you know nobody wants to tell somebody else how they can improve but it's really feeling comfortable in that professional discussion on opportunities to improve and that good catch kind of uh, focus uh, we do have a, a question here that i li like to get your thoughts on here it says um i guess where do you uh do you uh, now uh, see just culture after this verdict in terms of nursing education, you kind of commented a little bit with uh, your um, with your other comments, but can you summarize that? Where you see uh, just culture going after this verdict? Do you think it's going to change, or is it going to is it going to make it more difficult for our learners to feel like they can um, they can potentially uh, get prosecuted, or do you think it's going to um, provide a, an, a, an environment where individuals may not want to report. I mean, I'm going back to the fact that we have to, we have to plant that seed early in nursing education. Mm -hmm. Just some thoughts on that question. Um, well, I think that it's definitely a concern for the students. I know it was a concern for my graduating seniors. They were very worried about the idea. As a nurse educator, I think it shows us the importance of what we're doing and how we need to double down and how we need to do a better job of communicating what we're doing and what we're expecting out of our partners. Um, because that's part of our loop and our closed loop, right? That we're teaching the students this. And so that's what we expect to happen in the clinical setting. Um, I, I'm not sure that we know all the ripple effects yet yeah. of what's gonna happen. Wait, yeah. I don't think we will know. It, it'll. It's so, so important for us in uh, nursing education to make the feel make students um, have the tools that they feel like they can safely practice when they go out to the practice setting because we're just we're just the start, you know. You really 
I mean, I always tell the students, you're just really getting the basics. And that's what NCLEX tests, very basics. Um, but I found it really was interesting uh, as well. I, I looked at uh, NCLEX. I you know, always like to look at our, um, our results in terms of, because uh, you, know, you obviously can't uh, have a question that pulls in attitudes with NCLEX, but uh, a National Council of State Board of Nursing uh, does release a practice analysis um, of pr newly licensed registered nurses. So these are our learners that just have gotten licensed. So what they found, what I found was very interesting in their practice analysis that only 88.9% noted it was applicable in their setting when asked about acknowledging and documenting practice errors and near misses. And that should be 100%. Mm -hmm. you know, so it tells me that uh, we still have room to grow in terms, and as you mentioned, Danielle, that small percentage that you found in your study is, is alarming. Uh, that you know under 20 percent uh, so Marie I, I missed you on your some of your thoughts well um, I think being open and I, I like the fact that you know as Danielle said we need to change attitudes and so if that means we also change terminology as I mentioned earlier I think that that's you know, um, something that we can we something that we can do certainly I can certainly do is uh, and discuss this. You know, let's let's focus on the, the um, as you know, we said earlier that safe safety newsletter. Tell a story because stories go much further than grades. People remember those stories. This is what happened when this occurred, and this is how I felt about it. And what did you do about it? And that's uh, that's so important because they're still very the students are still very impressionable, and if only a small number of reporting from what you've talked about, how many are not reporting when they actually get to the floor mm -hmm. and don't want to because they have the idea that there's going to be repercussions because they are acknowledging that they made a mistake. And I do yeah, not I know any nurse. Candy's uh, made a comment in the Q&A, you know, that this sounds great in theory, and many of us have been teaching this as practice, but that did not help the nurse at Vanderbilt. No, uh, how do you address this issue of what should be done when an error is made, weighed against what happens to the nurse or when it is reported? Um, I would uh, I would also probably tell that uh, individual who put this uh, in the Q&A, there's a great discussion uh, that is available, uh, and I believe it's on YouTube, but it's uh, also posted under um, the Just Culture um, uh, website with David Marks. He, he posted his webinar and he's a lawyer, but he's also got a undergraduate degree in terms of engineering. And so he really sees it from a system standpoint as well as a lawyer standpoint. And I found it was the best discussion to really understand what happened to this nurse uh, in Tennessee from a legal standpoint. So I would direct you to that. Um, and uh, I think I put that in the references, but if not, feel free to reach out to me and I can give you the links. The Institute for Health Improvement uh, sponsored that webinar, and I believe it's uh, on their link as uh, their website as well. Um, the National League for Nursing, the American Nurses Association have all put out statements regarding this. But I think in education, we not, need to not just focus on the verdict and the outcome, but what what is currently occurring in our educational system that may uh, prevent nurses from feeling uh, uh, that there is a supportive system? How are how are our policies and procedures built within nursing education to start that culture thought about just culture? Because when you hear the term culture. It's a living process. It's not a one and done. So some thoughts from you, um, Maria, on uh, you know, how do we how do we how do we start that seed? Well, first of all, you have to open your mouth and talk about mistakes. Okay. What, what you have to talk about mistakes and acknowledge that there has when you have a mistake, we're doing a root cause analysis. If it's a sentinel event, you're going back to that root cause analysis, which is something that they almost Everybody learned in the very first semester in nursing school. 
let's talk about this. There's a system process. So what are you, of course, as nurses, we're the tail end of the system. So what are we doing to make sure that we're going to do what we're supposed to be doing? And if you have concerns, questions, ask. Don't be afraid. Don't try to do it on your own. Don't take shortcuts. And if you see a system problem, report it. Get something done about it and follow up. What was done about this? Because we're all 100% responsible for this. Even though if a lot of people have this attitude, it's not my job. We're also responsible because it is patient safety. And everybody in the entire cycle is responsible for patient safety. If that means that a medication was inadvertently um, trans mistransposed instead of hydroxyzine, the patient received instead of hydrolyzine, the patient received hydroxyzine, which is what's happened with me. Um, it took quite a few days before we finally figured out that the patient was supposed to be receiving hydrolyzine because her blood pressure kept rising. She didn't complain about itching, but she sure had issues with blood pressure. And it was a process event. We also, you know, everybody, you have to take the time to slow down and don't just assume that the machine is going to be correct. If you have a question about a medication, ask and verify with the physician. So you, you had a lot there in a, the, in a very uh, quick comment, but it's a lot to digest. And this is a topic that just is, again, um, I think will resonate. We just don't know what the ripple effects mm -hmm. were. Uh, final thoughts uh, as well, Danielle. I think that we need to take safety out of the lecture. We need to take safety out of the classroom and we need to create it as something that our students value and um, believe in. And so that goes, that happens through modeling, that happens through conversations, that happens through doing. It can be as simple as talking about when you've made a mistake in the classroom or on a test and modeling that transparency. And we need to demonstrate it system-wide. Our administrators need to be doing it. Um, we need to be doing, you know, like the newsletter, we need buy-in from everybody in order for it to work. Our students are our change makers. We start with them and slowly but surely it will happen if we do it right. What a great uh, ending comment to uh, close on. Uh, we were trying to keep this uh, webinar and it, we, could, uh, we could literally talk about this for hours uh, to uh, no more than 45 minutes. Um, uh, we, we do have some other questions in here, but some of the similar threads here is um, in terms of, um, um, you know, this outcome. I think, you know, personally for me, I'm going to continue to watch this case. Um, I know, uh, I believe it is um, May 13th that she will be sentenced. Uh, so there are lots of nurses out there supporting her uh, as well uh, with this. But I think as nurses, we feel for the fact that uh, this has impacted our community systemically um, and we have to keep our pulse on that as nurse educators. How can we uh, make that system uh, so in terms of nursing education so our learners feel they have a voice uh, and it's part of, the, as Daniel said, it's, it's their responsibility. Patient safety is our number one priority in nursing. Uh, everything we do is in terms of patient safety. So um, this is, as you'll see here, there is a, a QR code here for you to uh, take your cameras out if you want to uh, pop that. It will have some references that you can uh, begin to look at and maybe uh, explore a little bit and how that may influence you as a nurse educator. Uh, please feel free to reach out to any of the panelists if you have further questions that we weren't able to address today. Uh, like I said, my area of expertise is in simulation. So if I didn't get to your simulation questions, I have some thoughts and ideas that could probably be another webinar on how mm -hmm. simulation can uh, inter, uh, uh, interwoven the concept of just culture within simulation, how we would work in terms of uh, medication errors that occur in simulation and uh, still um, provide that uh, environment of uh, psychological safety. So feel free to reach out. I want to extend my, again, warmest appreciation to uh, Dr. Walker and Mrs. Summerall for uh, being involved in this very uh, uh, insightful discussion. Like I said, there's a lot more that can probably be discussed. Um, we appreciate everybody that has attended this webinar. We'll see, I see our Participant number is at 158. 
We had several other folks that uh, couldn't attend that signed up and they'll uh, be able to get a link to the recording as well as that those that participated today. Again, I want to thank you. Uh, appreciate your time and um, have a rest. Happy Nurses Week uh, for the remainder of Nurses Week. And um, as we close, I want to recognize that today is also a day of remembrance for our nursing colleagues who have lost their life um, in uh, as a result of COVID. Uh, the ANA has set aside this day as a day of remembrance. Uh, so I want to just kind of close with that, uh, remembering uh, those nurses who have given all to their profession, uh, literally, uh, and have um, helped us during the pandemic uh, at the ultimate sacrifice. So again, thank you uh, again for attending uh, this webinar and my panelists today.